<clears throat> Hello, and welcome to this GGB webinar. My name is Matthew, and I will be your Global Spec Moderator, and I want to review a few housekeeping items with you before we begin. Please take a moment to familiarize yourself with the operation of the user interface for today's webinar. The large window with the heading presentation in the upper left is the primary window for today's session. Just to the right of the main presentation window is the speaker bio window with background information on today's presenters. Just below that is the Q&A window. At any time during the presentation, you can enter a question into the box in the lower section of the window and click Submit. Your question will be placed into the queue to address when we get to the Q&A session. At the bottom of your screen, you will see additional buttons to enhance your webinar experience. To see what a particular button does, just place your mouse pointer over it and a tooltip will appear with a description of the button's function. Now I would like to introduce today's presenters. Marco Enger, PhD, and Giacomo Landi, PhD. Marco Enger holds a PhD in mechanical engineering with more than 10 years of experience in tribology, tri tribometry, and all related subtopics. In 2014, he became the senior tribologist at GGB and is responsible for all fundamental research works related to tribology. Before he joined GGB, he was working for the Competence Center of Tribology at Mannheim University. Giacomo Landi holds a PhD in material science from Drexel University, and he has over 10 years of experience in the bearing industry. Giacomo has primarily worked in modeling and numerical simulations for the fluid power industry. Giacomo joined GGB in 2019 and currently supports fluid power customers. Guys, welcome to today's event. And with that, I will pass things along to you to get started. Okay, thank you, Matt, for the introduction. Welcome, everybody. My name is Giacomo Landi. And uh, to start, I will say a few words about GGB. GGB is a tribological company which provides technology to reduce friction. And we do that by offering a wide variety of materials. You can see a few examples here. Metal polymers is uh, what GGB is probably most known for but we also make engineered plastics, fiber-reinforced composites, metals and bimetals. And more recently, we added the ability to coat, that is the ability to spray our polymers directly on customer parts. And uh, in this regard, GGP is pretty unique in that we offer both the polymer itself as well as the actual coding operation. So in this presentation, we are going to see an example of how GGB takes advantage of some uh, tribological properties to reduce friction. I will first introduce the theoretical basis of uh, transfer and sliding film. And after that, Marco will guide you through a specific example. So let's get started with our uh, first slide. So in this picture, you can see a typical tribological system. In the most general case, it's made of four components, but only three are shown here. There's uh, a bearing that is uh, number one in the picture. The bearing is running on a shaft. That's number two in the picture. And then there's the environment. That's number three. The fourth element that is not in the picture is the lubrication. That is the medium in between the two surfaces in contact. The tribological system is the uh, interaction among these elements. So. Obviously, there will be some variables that are known. These are our inputs. Physical quantities that act on the system, for example, load, speed, temperature, but also some disturbances like uh, 
vibrations or impurities. And by applying these inputs on the system, we generate some outputs. For example, wear and friction are, are listed here. So by looking at this uh, simple schematic, you can already appreciate how complex the, the tribological system can be. Because, for example, the speed can range from uh, 0 0.001 to 4 meters per second. That is uh, three orders of magnitude. The motion type can change. It could be rotational, but also sliding or some combination of the two. The temperature can also range from uh, well below freezing to very high. And uh, obviously there could be a variety of materials involved uh, in the contact. We have seen uh, some examples in the previous slide about the GGB products. So if we take it uh, a step further, this is uh, another schematics where we see the uh, polymer compound in, uh, in orange that is uh, pressed against the counter surface in blue. That would be the shaft in the previous uh, schematics. While it's moving with the velocity V. So, in dry sliding conditions, what happens is that polymer compo composites can form a, a thin, uniform, and protective film on the metallic counterface. Now, we tend to divide this film, the forms on the contact uh, interface, in two regions, the sliding film and the transfer film. The sliding film is the change on the contact surface due to the interaction. It could be a chemical composition change, a change in the microstructure, a change in mechanical properties, or, or any combination of those. The one thing to notice is that the, the word sliding refers to the fact that the, this thin film is the consequence of the relative sliding motion between, uh, between the two surfaces. The transfer film is uh, the direct transfer of material from material A to material B, from the orange to the blue. And this is the result of the wear. So you can think of it as, uh, for example, the debris that don't leave the system and that would deposit, deposit there. So we have a, a, an example here, a real picture of a sliding film, two pictures. You can see, for example, on the left, the pristine materials on the sides and the part where the sliding film has formed in between, in the middle. And then uh, same picture on the left, on the, on the right side, you see the, the, the sliding film. You can clearly appreciate how the surface differs when the sliding film uh, forms. Transfer film is uh, shown here. And one thing uh, pretty astound astounding about transfer film is that it's, it's really, really thin. And, uh, and very, very important. So it is uh, uh, w less than a micron in thickness. It's, uh, by comparison, about 100 times thinner than a human hair. And we can uh, look at it on another picture here. This is taken at 80,000 times magnification. So you can read this uh, from the bottom up. So you have the steel 
counter face at the bottom. And then as we move up towards the surface, you see the microstructure change, the, the material microstructure changes towards the surface. And then finally, we have uh, the uh, transfer film in uh, two layers here, actually. And you can see also in this picture some uh, delamination in between the, the two surfaces. So as I was saying, transfer film is very, very thin, but uh, it's uh, extremely important uh, in, uh, in a dry sliding because it's a protective layer that masks the, the roughness peaks at the, at the counter surface and thereby reducing surface interactions and therefore controlling wear and friction. A thing to add is that a good transfer film is, is uniform and consistent. And so what I'm going to show you here is an example of uh, how important this uh, could be. This is a, a pin on a disc. You can see the schematic here. There is a, a polymer compound that's pushed against a, a rotating disc that's uh, spinning. What's important to notice is that the counterface roughness is, uh, has an RZ of about one and a half micron. And if we run this experiment, if we plot the wear in microns against the sliding distance, you see the, what that looks like. There is a sharp, like a high wear rate in the beginning. And then after a transitory period, there is a transient film formation and the wear rate changes uh, dramatically. It reduces dramatically. So you have about uh, 60 microns of wear after I would say something like 5,000 uh, meters of operation, so five kilometers. But if we repeat the exact same thing on a different case where the roughness is uh, only four microns, I mean only, is uh, almost three times, uh, now, what happens if, is that we have uh, premature failures. The, the wear rate never changes compared to the initial value. And so you reach uh, quickly 60, 80 microns of wear, and then you have the failure of the system. And that, that's because at this, uh, at this uh, value of roughness, the, the the transfer film is not effective in, uh, in controlling wear. So, so we go back to where we started. And uh, these are some examples of uh, GGP materials. That is to show, you, we, we have some uh, um, mush, polymers, some tape polymers, some uh, fiber reinforced composites or uh, coding, coded surfaces. And the trick is to be able to control the, the formation of the transfer film to our advantage in a wide variety of situations. So, what I'm gonna do now, I will leave it to Marco, who will uh, guide you through some uh, specific examples of how GGB is able to take advantage of the transfer film to, to control wear and, uh, and friction. Thank you. Thanks, Chagomo. So, we already discussed that slight active materials used for dry operating contacts have an excellent intrinsic solid lubricant lubrication. 
So this provides the feature to form transfer films on the attacking counterface throughout the relative motion. So the the unavoidable the unavoidable wear of these materials when sliding against the harder counterface generates wear debris. This debris can escape from the contact zone or may stay and hopefully deposit to, to the counter surface. So when debris adheres, it can form a transfer film which potentially protects the contact from, from further wear damage. So a high protection rate can be achieved when the film has a high quality. High quality is often linked to specific microstructure features of the transfer film. So the film formation needs to be consistent or uniform. We can also say that the transfer film needs to have a good masking quality um, on, on the counter surface. In other words, the film needs to have a good and high coverage rate of the counter surface. The other essential property of the film is its robustness. So robustness is linked to the capability of the film to withstand the ongoing tribological stress actions. Um, we also believe that the quality of the transfer film is affected by diverse factors dictated by the related tribological system. So as a reflection, we can say that the transfer film could also be understood as a response um, of a specific tribological system encompassing um, following aspects. So the induced collective stress or the operational input parameters, the specific property profile of the opposing surface, the composition of the self-replicating material, and most likely the conditions of the surrounding atmospheres uh, of the surrounding atmosphere are factors to consider. Um, previous slides also show that the transfer film formation is essential for tri-operating sliding contacts. Uh, we also stated that it is quite challenging to design materials with the feature to form very robust transfer films, hopefully detached from the boundary conditions of a specific tribological system. Um, today, I will lead you through a material development diary showing a material design approach to improve the transfer film forming capabilities of slide active materials. As a material designer, changing a well-known material is always a good starting point to impart new features into, into a material. Um, the potential approaches for enhanced transfer film forming capabilities are very, very broad. So changing of the structural architecture could be one approach um, or the change of the material composition. So this could be a change of the different volume fractions in the, in the composite, or we could use a new matrix or maybe the addition of new fillers. So the use of additional fillers seems to be a very promising modification me uh, method to enhance the capability of slide active materials to form better and more robust transfer films. Um, another potential arises when using a combination of different fillers. So this can create potential synergetic effects and thus lead to an ad uh, additional uh, improvement. And when we create such new compounds, those will then be tested uh, using tribological testing uh, with variable boundary condition. And this also includes the monitoring of the performance and transfer film changes. Um, in the end, the key goal is to understand how the different puzzle parts fit together. And the high level goal is that when we can control the transfer film, we might can control the friction rare responses of a tribological system. So a typical polymer compound is subject of this investigation. It consists of a polymer matrix slight modified using PTFE particles. This compound was modified by adding two different nanofillers. The first particle we used is a ceramic based particle. The mean diameter is 50 nanometer for this group of particles. Um, the second particle is an organic particle. The, the mean diameter is around about 25 micrometers and the, the thickness of those particles is 5 to 8 nanometers. So a, a particle is classified as nanoparticle when minimum one dimension is smaller than 100 nanometers. So this applies for both particles used in this investigation. The, the right side shows you the tests we used to assess the performance of all compounds. Most of the tests were conducted using a simple model tester. The test geometry we used was a pin on disk test setup. 
In the second phase of testing, we assess the drawbological performance using a Bouchef contact. Um, this testing is linked to one of the biggest challenges in tribology, in, in tribology, which is the transferability of data relations and observations from one system to another system. However, for today's presentation, we will be focusing only on model tests. So throughout the next slide, I would like to show you some, some interesting data. So the standard polymer compound steel pair investigated normally passes two characteristic friction and wear phases in its entire wear life. So in most tests, it starts with a higher friction, which declines with progress in covered sliding distance until a steady state phase is reached. And this low operational friction remains the entire death duration. Uh, the wear characteristic of this pair can also be divided into, into stages. So the first phase is characterized by a high wear curve slope. The wear rate decreases until the operational performance window is reached. And during this phase, a linear wear characteristic is clearly evident. This transient manner in friction and wear is often simplified using the common expression running in of a tribological system, encompassing all essential processes and alterations in the interface of two contacting surfaces in relative motion to achieve a stable, and oper uh, to achieve a stable operational performance window. <clears throat> so several tests were performed for identifying the limitations and the comfort zone of the standard compound. Therefore, a PV mapping was, was used, illustrated on the, on the right diagrams. The tests were conducted using a 100 chrome 6 steel disc hardened to 60 HRC, and we used the concentrical grinding process to achieve a roughness value of uh, roughly RSET 3 micrometers. The top diagram shows you the initial material consumption as a function of different PV combinations. Another expression for the initial material consumption is the running in wear depth level before reaching the operational performance window. The red area shows you the region of potential premature failure due to the high extent of running in wear. So many technical applications only accept a certain wear depth limit. So reaching a critical wear depth limit before transiting into the um, operational performance window can shorten the dura durability of the driver contact and thus impact the whole application. The bottom diagram represents the initial and steady state wear rate against the different PV combinations. Um, so the results show that the standard compound reacts very, very sensitive on changes of the tribological system. So increasing the PV combination normally results in higher wear. Um, high speeds can be critical, especially when we reach the glass tr transition temperature of the polymer matrix. So this leads to a change of the polymer state, which results in a reduction of the mechanical properties. And such a drop in mechanical properties is often accompanied with a lower resistance to wear actions. Um, we also saw that the system tends to premature failure. Um, in most cases, we, we have very high running in wear levels before we reach the, um, the, the operational performance window. Um, the impact of the countersurface topography has also been investigated in this study. The results are shown on the bottom diagram. Um, it illustrates the same key wear characteristics as a function of the counterface roughness heights. Um, the initial material consumption is illustrated in green, and the, um, the area of premature failure is, is, um, is also shown. The initial and operational wear rates are indicated in blue and red. The tests were performed using the same steel crate. The contact pressure was 11.3 megapascals in combination with a continuous sliding speed of 0.1 meters per second. Um, the counter surface roughness can be a dominating factor when experiencing high, high polymer wear. This is accompanied with a change of the dominating wear mechanisms. So for rough surfaces, abrasive wear actions dominate. For smooth surfaces, adhesive interactions are highly present. Um, a wear optimum was found for our set one micrometer. So potential explanations are that we have an optimal balance between adhesive and abrasive interactions. Um, Another potential explanation is that moderate counter surface promote the establishment of a stable transfer film, or maybe we have a synergetic effect of, of both. Um, 
So the, the results show that the standard compound has clear limitations regarding its tribological performance. The blue points indicate the areas of interest for, produ for product improvement. The idea is to see whether nanofilters can improve the performance outside the comfort zone of the standard compound. <clears throat> So this slide shows you the impact of nanofilters at moderate load conditions. The tests were done at 11.3 megapascals in combination with the continuous sliding speed of 0.1 meters per second. Again, we used the same steel crate. The steel was also uh, um, um, crowned to an R set value of three micrometers. The diagram shows you the wear performance of the different um, compounds. The bars show, again, the three wear characteristics, the initial material consumption and the initial and steady state wear rate. And so using nanofilters leads to a clear reduction of the initial material consumption. So the value changed from 175 micrometers to 50. In other words, the system behavior changed from an early failing system into a well-performing system. What are the potential explanations? It could be a higher robustness against the wear actions, or it could be an early formation of a robust and protective transfer film, or maybe a synergetic effect of both. Um, both the initial and operational wear rates are, can be reduced when incorporating nanofilters into the polymer composite. Um, we measure three to four times lower wear rates when we add nanofilters. In synergy with the clear reduction of the initial material consumption, this gives an obvious longer wear life. And the data shows or suggests that there is maybe a wear optimum found at the medium volume fractions of filler A. So this diagram shows you the impact on friction performance. Increase in friction is obvious when using higher volume fractions of filler A. At the moment, we think that this comes from an agglomeration of ceramic nanoparticles. Such agglomerates lead then to deforming interactions which contribute to friction. To, to friction. Um, such interaction could also deter, disturb the film formation. Um, for filler B, we do not really see an impact on friction. Minimal lower friction at higher volume fractions of filler B. So this slide shows the performance at higher loads. The load was changed from 11.3 megapascals to 20 megapascals in combination with previously mentioned speed level. And the rest of the testing boundary conditions remained unchanged. The, the standard compound directly failed at high loads. The system didn't transit into an operational performance window. Adding nanofilters clearly improves the wear performance. We can see a clear reduction of the initial material consumption. We see a clear transition into the, an operation performance window. Again, wear optimum was found for, two volume, uh, for um, medium volume fractions of filler A. Um, high volume fractions of filler A leads to, to higher wear. Um, agglomerates of filler A cause an abrasive damage of the countersurface. Um, this results in a roughening of the countersurface, making it more rough, more aggressive. A rougher countersurface leads then to abrasive-induced polymer matrix wear. In the end, we can talk about the two-step wear process of the compound. At low volume fractions of filler B, um, we can also if, uh, see that we improve the wear performance. Higher volume fractions uh, reduce the wear stability of, of that compound. <clears throat> So next diagram shows you the impact on friction. Obvious friction increase when using high volume fractions of filler A. So we also see that the friction increases over time. So the starting friction is low and the friction measured in the operational performance window is high. Um, this can be an indicator for an inhomogeneous dispersion of filler A. Um, Filler B, again, no real impact on the friction performance, minimal lower friction level at higher volume fractions. So in, in previous slides, we mentioned a few statements regarding the change of tribological performance of the investigated material pairs. So hypothesis one stated that the improved wear performance is linked to a better transfer film quality. Um, formed on the countersurface when using nanofilters. 
Um, a high quality film can effectively protect the contact from, from severe damage. We have seen that in, 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 in the previous slides. Um, hypothesis two is linked to abrasive and deforming interactions in the contact interface due to the nests of agglomerated ceramic particles within the polymer compound. Um, such interactions normally lead to, to higher friction. We also saw an increase in friction with progress in sliding distance, which could be an indicator that the ceramic particle nests are mainly located below the top surface areas of that compound. Um, further, we also saw a potential two-step wear process for the, for the compound containing high volume fractions of filler A. So abrasive interactions cause a damage of the countersurface, and this change of the countersurface makes it rough and, and aggressive, as, as already stated. And this increase in aggressivity leads then to more polymer wear. And so we conducted additional investigations to corroborate those, those statements. So this slide shows you an overview of the different methods we use to describe the transfer films qualitatively. Um, Further, it shows you the pro and cons of each of each method. So digital microscopy is an easy and fast to handle tool. However, it shows clear limitations regarding magnifications. Um, the image shows normally a weak contrast between the transfer film and the surrounding areas, making the transfer film detection quite, quite challenging. Um, and this is quite often the case when we have a rough counter surface. So this, these problems disqualify this method as a basis for the quantitative assessment of the transfer film quality using additional image processing tools. Um, SEM imaging is relative, relatively slow. However, it gives really high quality and high contrast images of, of the transfer film. Um, we use backscattered electron detection because it provides an additional advantage compared to the standard uh, secondary electron detection. So this method or this, this mode emphasizes the material contrast while suppressing topography details. And that effect is shown on the SEM images on the right side. So the left picture shows you the SEM image, the typical SEM image using the SE mode. So the transfer film is hardly detectable. Using BSE with its, with its high material contrast helps to detect the transfer film. So the light areas on, uh, on, on that image are the metallic counter surface, and the dark areas in that image are the organic polymeric film. Such high contrast images are really suitable for a further quantitative analyzing, uh, analysis using the image processing software. So this slide shows you a comparison between a transfer film formed using a standard compound and a transfer film generated by a nano compound with nanofiller B. Um, the films were generated using the model test configuration with 11.3 megapascals in combination with the 0.1 meters per second, and the roughness, as already stated, had a surface finish. Um, the, 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 the counter surface had a surface finish of three micrometers. Um, the light areas are the metallic counter surface, and the dark areas represent the organic material, the polymer film. So the standard compound generates a weak film. We can see many open areas without polymer coverage. Um, so we can also state the film is practically not existent. So the polymer deposition can mainly be found in the negative roughness features of, of the counter surface. So the film formed using the nano compound shows a significant better masking quality. The film appears uniform. The film is thin and well adhered. The image also shows that the plateau-like topography structures of the counterface are also covered with, with polymeric film. And such a change in the transfer film morphology is an indicator for a potential change of the bonding mechanisms between transfer film and, and the countersurface. So this slide shows you the microstructural features of the transfer films formed using um, the filler A compounds. Um, the test setup was the same model testing. Um, the top image shows the transfer film formation on the counter surface after sliding against the nano compound with the low volume fractions of filler A. The bottom shows the film formed by the compound with a higher volume fraction of, of filler A. 
Um, both compounds generate a high quality transfer film. The film appears to be uniform. It has a high masking quality. The film is again thin and well adhered. And we do see this covering of the plateau like topography structures. Um, the image of the counterface that slid against the compound with the high concentrations of filler A suggests a potential furring, grooving, or plowing of the counter surface. And this would confirm our previously introduced statement regarding abrasive interactions, which happens because of nanoparticles agglomerated in, in, in the compound. And such interactions can lead to a higher friction. We have seen that in the tribal results. And such interaction also increase the aggressivity of the counter surface, leading to higher and uh, to higher compound wear, and we have seen that as well in the, in, the, in, the, in the tests. So at the moment, one question is really pushing us. So can we find such agglomerated particle nests in the nanofiller A compounds? To answer this question, the filler A compound were deeper investigated. So on this slide, I would like to show you the results of this in investigation. So the method we used was SEM imaging in combination with an EDS mapping to see the element distribution. The top image shows you the electron image. At the first glance, all particles are homogeneously distributed within the polymer matrix. So the bottom image shows you the element distribution. The left image shows you the fluorine mapping. Everything which is red is a PDFE particle. The particles are well distributed within the matrix and the particle size is, is normal. Um, the bottom right image shows you the filler A mapping. So everything which appears white is, a partic is, is, is particle A. So the particle distribution is, is good. Um, the image also shows that we have a large number of agglomerated nests of filler A. Uh, looking at the scaling, we see that these agglomerates can have a size of 10 to 30 micrometers. Um, such huge ceramic particles can be very aggressive in terms of abrasive, uh, of, uh, in terms of abrasive and deforming interactions. So, the largest nests were also found underneath the top surface areas, and that explains the friction alteration over time. So, low starting friction and higher friction in the operational performance window. So, wear of the material leads to an exposure of these agglomerated filler A nests, and this results in abrasive and deforming interact. Uh, uh, this results in abrasive and deforming interactions, which contributes to, to friction. And the, the results also show that when we use smaller amounts of, of, of those fitters, we can really reduce the agglomeration in, in, in the compound. <clears throat> so, throughout the next slide, I would like to show you a method for the quantitative assessment of the transfer film quality. As I already stated, it is very time consuming to analyze a huge number of or high number of SEM images. Um, how we can analyze those images can change from day to day. So an objective tool is really missing. Um, the other problem is that qualitative features like thin, well adhered, high coverage rate cannot easily be linked to tribal data. Um, so to, over to overcome these drawbacks, we developed a MATLAB algorithm. Um, and this algorithm is used to quantitatively characterize the quality of a transfer film. The picture on that slide shows you the functionality of the algorithm. So the algorithm determines the free space length between polymer patches. In other words, it determines the geometrical density of polymer patches. Um, further, it determines the coverage rate of of, of, of the transfer film, and it, did, it, and it distinguished between thick and thin areas of, of the transfer film. Um, to do so, the, the algorithm scans the SEM image from left to right, from top to down. While scanning, the algorithm ignore, ignores dark information, and when a white area is detected, a square expands in X and Y direction. And when the square borders touch then a dark area, this stops the expansion of the square and the dimension of this of the square are the, the dimensions of the square are then recorded. So before we can use the SEM images, we need to clean them um, using an image pre-processing step. 
So on the left side of this slide, we can see the virgin SEM image. So the right sh side shows you the, the, the clean version of the SEM image. So the pre-processing steps include the following um, um, points. So we cut off the bottom legend. This is important because the algorithm is, is, is a bit stupid and would identify this as transfer because it has a black and white appearance. Um, what we also did is we normalized the grayscales of the image. So an as the image normally has 255 grayscales, and we re reduced this down to three. So white areas represent local voids in the transfer film. In other words, no film is present in those areas. Light gray areas are um, um, representative for um, thin films and black coloring is, is used for thick films and thick polymer patches. What we also did is that we added a noise filtering. So we applied a noise filtering to, um, to the whole image to remove single pixels with no direct neighbors. And a second step, uh, we applied a median filtering to reduce um, um, the pixel noise uh, a bit more. So as already stated, the algorithm scans the SEM image from left to right and from top to down. So, and it expands squares in the void areas to determine the free space things between polymer patches. And this is done for three different areas of the counter surface disk. And um, further, we run this algorithm for four different magnifications. So this is important to ensure a sufficient statistic regarding the transfer film quality. Uh, on this slide, you see the outcomes of the quantitative assessment of the transfer film quality and how they correlate to the tribological performance. Um, the upper diagram shows you the steady stay wear rate in correlation to the free space lengths between polymer patches. As already discussed, another term for the free space lengths is the geometrical density of polymer patches. Um, the steady state wear rate is uh, represented through the purple line, and the free space length is, the, is illustrated using the, uh, the, the, the bars. So the bottom diagram shows you the transfer film coverage rate and how it correlates to the wear performance. Um, the wear performance is again the purple line. The bars shows you the total coverage area and the area covered with the thin film and the area covered with a, with a thick film. So the results show a good correlation between um, the wear performance and the free space length, making this value an important microstructure feature to determine the transfer film quality. Um, the, the cover trade also correlates well with the tripod performance. Now, this gives hints that maybe a minimum coverage rate is required to promote optimal wear performance. Um, this is the second important value. So now I will conclude my, my talk. So throughout today's webinar, we discussed the tribological system and the system relating thinking process. We also discussed friction and wear and showed that these values are system values instead of being intrinsic material properties. We gave a brief introduction into sliding and transfer films and their role for tri operating um, driver contacts. We also showed that these films are crucial for satisfactory functioning of tri operating tribological contacts. Uh, we, we also demonstrated that nanofillers are a promising filler concept to develop materials with an enhanced capability to form robust films and thus improve friction and, and wear performance. Um, I think we also demonstrated well that. Tribology helped to identify critical factors influencing the, the system, solutions to minimize wear, solutions to maximize system efficiency, and solutions to extend the system life cycle. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. And Matt, do we have any questions? Yes, uh, thank you so much for that. Um, so. We do have some questions uh, that have come in from the audience. Uh, so we're going to move into answering those right now. Uh, to the audience, if you haven't submitted your question yet, you can do so now by entering it in the Q&A box and clicking Submit. And we'll try to get to it before the close of the session. Um, I also would like to answer a few questions that came in asking about the slides and whether or not the replay will be available. Uh, the slides can be accessed in a PDF version by accessing the Resources tab across the bottom of your screen, and you should be able to download a copy of the PDF slides. 
In addition, uh, the on-demand replay of this entire event, including the Q&A session that we're about to move into, will be available uh, to watch again about an hour after the live session ends, and it will be available for the next 90 days. Okay, let's move into the Q&A session. So, first question from our audience. What was the criteria for choosing the nano fillers? Guys? Um, I will take that, Marco. Um, this was based on a broad literature research. Okay, excellent. Thank you for that. Um, and moving on to the next question. What is the composition of a transfer film? Um, this question is, is quite complex. So the transfer films mainly consist of the material that slid against this particular counter surface. And so, however, we do know that the transfer film composition can vary over time. A typical example would be a film formed by a multi by a material with a multi-layer architecture. For such materials, we can see that the film alters throughout the sliding process. We also know that the transferred material can undergo chemical reactions, which lead to new chemical species in the transfer film. So it, it's quite complex, this, this question. Excellent, thank you for that. And I just wanna remind the audience, we have our experts from GGB online and ready to answer your questions. So you can enter your question now. Uh, in the Q&A box and click Submit. And we'll try to answer it before we close. Okay, moving on to the next question from our audience. Uh, what are the bonding mechanisms of transfer films? So some transfer films adhere on the counter face through a mechanical anchoring effect. Um, other films are formed because where debris accumulates in the negative roughness features of, of the counter surface, um, we also know that polymer patches can adhere based on weak van der Waals forces. And for very thin and well covering transfer film, I think that they adhere based on a mechanical chemical interaction with the, with the counter surface. Excellent. Thank you for that. Okay. And now for our next question from the audience. Uh, can transfer films be formed in a vacuum? Yes, they can. Excellent. Thank you for that. Uh, and that may have been our last question for now. We'll give the audience a moment to submit some more. Um, like I said, if we don't get to your question uh, during today's q and session, we will follow up after the webinar. Matt, so let me, maybe I can add one. I'm sorry. Absolutely. Please go maybe. ahead. Mm -hmm. No, I was uh, just uh, adding a comment to the last question about uh, the vacuum. And yes, it, it, it's possible, but uh, obviously these are not uh, practical industrial operating conditions. So that would be a very special case Thank you for that extra commentary. Okay, and just waiting for some other, okay, here we go. Next question from the audience. Thank you very much. Um, are there any lubricants currently available commercially with nanofillers? Uh, that, I, I'm not sure. I, I'm not. Uh, I'm not really aware of uh, of any. There may be, but I, I I don't know the answer to that. Okay, no problem. Solid. Thank you very much for that. Oh, please go ahead. No, for solid lubricants, we do know that there exist products which which use nanofitters. Yes. Excellent, thank you for that. Okay, and it looks like that was our last question for now. So we are gonna move to close and wrap things up right there. Uh, so guys, thank you so much for taking the time. Oh, 
we just have another question that came in. Let's 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 get this one in there as well. Okay, here's another question from the audience. Uh, is the use of binders necessary when combine, combining PTFE with fillers? Not necessarily. There, ex there exist also material concepts which use a PTFE matrix with, with fillers. So an additional binder is not necessarily needed to generate a compound using PTFE plus fillers. Excellent. Thank you for that. Okay. And that was our last question for now. So we're going to wrap things up. So again, guys, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today and taking the time to answer some questions from the audience as well. And of course, thank you to all of our audience members for being part of this webinar event. Uh, you will be receiving an email from us with a link to the on-demand version, like I mentioned before, so you can come back and watch this again or share it with your colleagues. And lastly, please take a moment to complete a survey, which will appear on your screen at the end of this live webinar. For on-demand viewers, you will find the survey located along the bottom of your attendee console in the survey widget. Again, thank you for taking the time to attend this webinar event. Take care, and we will talk with you soon.